This is Reimagining Higher Education, your go-to podcast with remarkable education leaders sharing personal stories from their experience in and around the sector, including reflection and hope for progress in the sector. With your host, Sir Eric Thomas, former Vice-Chancellor at the University of Bristol, President of Universities UK and Chair of the Worldwide University Network, and now Studiosity Advisory Board Member. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Steve West, who is the Vice-Chancellor of the University of West of England and was a very close colleague with me in Bristol, but at the moment is uh, President of Universities UK. And uh, uh, I think what we're going to explore today is Steve's view from that position of the current status of uh, UKHE, and then perhaps in a, in a more imaginary situation, think what reimagining higher education might mean in 10 or 20 years time. But Steve, a great welcome. And if you could give a little pen portrait of your career so far. Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. Great to be here and, and great to be talking with you again. Um, well, my background's very unconventional, I guess, as a vice chancellor. I came uh, into the world uh, via podiatry as a foot specialist, foot surgeon, um, and then crossed from the world of the NHS uh, into the world of academe and uh, managed to balance the two together for a while. And then as I got through to sort of heads of department and dean level, discovered that actually trying to ride those two horses at the same time just became impossible. So I put the scalpel away and decided that I'll focus on uh, trying to get uh, the academic space into the best shape I possibly could. And then uh, eventually became a vice chancellor, which puts you in a place which is amazing in many ways in that it, it allows you to meet brilliant people uh, who can help you try and shape an organization, universities uh, from both inside, but also from influence outside. And that's really what I've been doing for the last um, 18 years now. So I'm quite a long, standing vice chancellor and unusually um i've stayed at one institution um university west of england as you said uh, eric and met amazing colleagues and continue to meet amazing colleagues and every day wake up and got and, and discover something new that's happening in our institutions and go wow well i never thought that would happen and that's been i think that well i never knew that was going to happen sort of uh uh, outlook uh, and experience of life has stayed there throughout um, because universities are really special places. They are places where amazing things happen every day and mm. often we don't really acknowledge it or know it and yet that transformation, that, that ability to, to move something forward and give people opportunity help develop them, allow them to thrive and flourish is the thing that gets me out of bed every morning. And I Brilliant. can honestly say I've never woken up in the morning and gone, oh, gosh, I've got to go there again. No, I have to say I had exactly the same feeling when I was at Bristol. I remember um, pointing out to the good folk of Bristol that Bristol was the only city on the planet that had two surgeons as yeah. vice chancellors of its two universities. And, and that I've pointed out to them, the great thing that surgeons can do is make decisions because they have to make decisions and make decisions quickly. So I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that went down, Steve, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, once you've done the surgery, you can't really go back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, our listeners will be beginning to wonder where the hell we're going to go next. So I better, uh, yeah. uh, but so how do you? I mean, it's a very, very fractious, very changing, very difficult world. I mean, when I think of the world I went into as vice chancellor in two thousand and one, couldn't have been more different than that. How do you see the HE as it is now in twenty twenty three in the UK uh, in the current environment? OK, the, the first thing I say is that universities um, are clearly hitting some really difficult headwinds. We're being buffeted around quite a lot at the moment. And some of that is clearly uh, the context within which we find ourselves post pandemic um, and the huge impact that had on our institutions um, are uh, given that our people 
um, had to learn to do things differently, both staff and students. But also, I guess we're buffeting because globally, the world feels pretty unstable at the moment um, mm. with climate change and with um, the um, global insecurities around um, um, the politics. All of that is clearly impacting on universities and how we think. And in the UK, we have our own sort of mini microcosm of uh, that, given the current, um, I think, quite uh, difficult home politics that we're dealing with. Now, universities have always had um, a set of relationships with, with politicians and different political parties and persuasions that broadly get along and broadly try and move things forward. Um, but over the past few years, universities have been seen perhaps in more of a negative space than positive in that um, government often uses uh, narratives that send pretty mixed messages out to the public, pretty mixed messages out to society generally, but also mixed messages um, to the world in terms of the quality and the capabilities of uh, UK higher education. And actually, some of the things that they say clearly are not based on evidence and are damaging. And I think the university sector as a whole is trying to work out how actually to work more effectively with um, governments uh, and recognizing that the devolved nations clearly uh, in the UK um, have uh, different nuancing. So Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland and England, in terms of education, it's devolved and therefore there are slightly different perspectives in each part of the, of the nation. But we're having to work hard, I guess, to present a positive view um, of higher education. And we should be able to do it really easily. There are, as I said, the UK higher education system um, is world class. There is no doubt about that. Whether we look at learning and teaching, research and enterprise, we are the envy uh, of many other countries. And yet that's not quite how it's presented in the press or um, in the, the, the political uh, narrative. We, I think, as a sector are incredibly adaptive. We are, I think, incredibly innovative. Um, and we have been able to, I guess, work our way through some big, um, big challenges, COVID being one, where within 24, 48 hours of lockdown, we managed as a sector to turn everything into online. That's a huge um, mm. uh, indication of just how resilient and how flexible universities are. Um, and of course, um, uh, many of our research intensive universities were front and center of creating uh, vaccines that we could roll out and support um, the globe in, in terms of our science and technology. But every university, I think, was front and center of their local communities and worked incredibly hard to support not only itself as an institution, but also to reach out beyond and support businesses and communities during a really difficult time. That's, a, I think, a very, very strong narrative that we, um, maybe I have lost. The memory doesn't last very long. Mm. Uh, and now it's more about um, how we are delivering value for money, how we're delivering uh, uh, differently to different audiences, um, and how we can support our local economies um, in terms of skills um, and, of course, um, uh, knowledge. So the narrative's shifting a bit and we're learning how to do that uh, with government. And of course, when we have conversations with government, we point out actually the commonality. There is a common purpose here. We want our, our education system to be the best and we want to create opportunities and possibilities for society to engage and develop the skills that the country needs. Um, so in many ways, we should be able to do that together more effectively than we are at the minute. It was one of the things that always slightly puzzled me um, because it, it didn't seem to matter what the political persuasion of the government is, is or was. There was always 
a slight, in inverted commas, suspicion around universities. And, um, you know, on any, on any objective criteria, universities are a fabulously successful part of the British economy, culture, life, education. You can't, but, but acknowledging that seems to be somewhat difficult for um, external agencies. And I'm not just talking solely about government. And, and I wondered if it was because they're, they're rather enclosed spaces which people don't normally penetrate. So they, 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 they tend to be sort of slightly over there. And also they're full to the brim of very clever people who don't mind criticizing and commenting on anything. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, it's amazing how often the word professor is in front of an expert on the television or the radio. You know, do you think yeah, that it, might be part of the suspicion it, of universities? It, it may be, although I think uh, what's really interesting is all of those that are commentating um, probably have been to university. Sure. And that could be a, over a period of, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So they they bring a little bit of their perspective, their baggage, if you like, or their experiences into the conversation. And they assume that nothing's changed. And of course, a lot's changed. Lots of universities, and I agree with you, we, we can sometimes look a bit remote and disconnected, but for the last, at least the last 10 years, universities have been actively trying to open up and bring communities into um, the spaces uh, that are called universities. That civic engagement, that piece around outreach and trying to encourage people to think of their universities as a resource, as a place to come to, to explore. And so I think that is slowly shifting, um, but nevertheless, there is still this stand back, um, them up the hill or them down the road. And it's, and it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge for us to make sure that we really are seen as part of communities, um, sort of of and with, rather than slightly to one side. Um, and we've got work to do, let's be honest, there's still work that we can do in that space. But I do think that the more we start to, to work in partnership with our local communities and recognise our local economies, but also for many institutions, the global economies that we're engaging with, does add value to what the UK can offer and universities, if we can find that sweet spot that does allow us to describe in a, in a meaningful way, not talk to ourselves, but actually talk to communities about what we can offer, what we can do together, and also what they can bring to us to mm. co-create a different approach. Yeah. Um, our universities now, our, our staff and students are incredibly diverse. They are representative of the communities that we live in, national mm. and international. So that diversity, the fact that, you know, in the UK, well over half of our 18 year olds are now accessing university tertiary education of some sort means that that more people know about what universities are about and my argument will be when when lifelong learning really takes off that's another opportunity to shine and open you know shine a light open the windows and let people in probably right. using different modalities but the more people that engage, the more likely we are to get the, to do the right thing. I mean, just as a, an, as, a, an aside, I interviewed Steve Smith for one of these podcasts. Yeah. And he was set an ambition to get 600,000 international students per year into the UK by 2030. And they've already <laughs> got them. Yeah. So if the market is testing what is attractive about our higher education experience, then it's pretty obvious that the market that's paying uh, the direct fees thinks that it's, which I presume finally brings me on before we move on to the future, Steve, about if I was, you know, as a hardened, wizened old vice chancellor, the one thing I'd be worried about at the moment is my finance yeah, I would be seeing costs going through the roof, yep. fixed fees. What in the world does the energy cost mean to me running on very narrow margins? And I just wondered, 
how robust is the current financial state for universities? So I think it's fragile and, and variable. So we had, there was a recent OFS report that came out, was looking at 2021 data. And I think there, overall, the sector was being described as resilient, robust, and had good finances. However, there were 43 universities, I think, at that point that were um, posting deficits for the second year. Right. Now, that's a lot. My, Steve. That's, that's a lot. Up. That is a lot. My concern is that increasingly, um, as we go over the next couple of years, universities will be posting deficits. Now, uh, the big worry is uh, simply that universities, having tried to get the books to balance uh, both across the, the research funding streams, the, lear the learning, teaching funding streams and uh, funding streams that are sort of um, derived through partnerships with businesses, so enterprise, the books are getting harder to balance and we're losing money in effect uh, against our costs on both teaching and research. Now, mm. in the past, we've been able to sort of, you know, fix a bit of that. I think we'll see more universities go into deficit. I think the projections that take us out to 25, 26, 27 are really worrying. Um, and I'm certainly saying that as UUK president that we haven't got a sustainable model. The business model that we all operate in the UK is, is not working. Um, and we'll see more universities uh, get into serious trouble. The, the global politics are such that actually we may have a big shock if certain communities start to not look towards the UK for higher education. These are the international student communities. That tap can get turned off very, very quickly and is completely out of our control. Mm. And I do worry that, that when we look at the balance across, we have a home student income stream, which is not keeping pace with inflation. 12 years of flat uh, fee. My understanding is that that fee is likely to remain the same until 2027. It's certainly in the, in the, doc, in the legal environment till 2025, but no incoming government's gonna have a chance to really get their heads around it. So I'm saying 2027, that's an eye-watering drop in the value of that fee. We will be down by 2025, we'll be just under six and a half thousand against the 9,250. Roll it out further, then it's gonna be near a six. We simply can't carry on with that model. Something has to give. Now, either our business model and de delivery models have to change significantly in universities, or we have to find ways of creating new income streams. And of course, that's not easy in an environment where people generally across the globe are becoming more and more price sensitive and more and more challenged um, with their local economies. So I'm, I'm not, I'm suggesting that we've got to find a different way of doing yes, some of the stuff that we're currently doing. Otherwise we'll see universities fail. Um, we will see the need for mergers and we will see some pretty difficult things happening in the same way that it's already happened in FE. Right. And which brings me on very nicely to the second half of the uh, uh, discussion, Steve, which is the one about um, the future. And uh, I always say that, you know, if you, one of the great things to do is to go to Bologna. I mean, to go to Bologna anyway, uh, food is beyond belief, you know, and all the gorgeous Italian wine. But and to sit on the Via Zamboni, which is the road for Bologna University, which is the oldest university in Europe. And um, the I remember sitting on the Via Zamboni, probably having an espresso, looking down and there were the students, you know, all milling around. And, uh, you know, you can imagine the scene. And I thought, do you know, if I'd been sitting here 500 years ago, 
the scene may well have not been that much different. The student body would, of course, have been almost universally male, but <laughs> there would have been student. And I was thinking, blimey, you know, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have looked that different. And actually, the mode of teaching wouldn't have changed all that much. I mean, quite seriously. So, you know, is one of the 10 to 20 year scenarios that actually nothing much changes. And you have, of course, <laughs> talked about the dynamic of the business model. Or I had a fascinating podcast with uh, Anthony Smith from UCL, who changed the whole of the curriculum in front of COVID for UCL. Yeah. who's saying, you know, things like hybrid teaching really don't work all that well. And, you know, you're either going to do it all on Zoom or you need to have everybody in the room. And so I just wondered from where you are, do you think we'll have a Via Zamboni experience in, <laughs> or <laughs> there'll be a very different world? I'd, I'd love not to come back from Bologna, by the way. I mean, that does feel, at the moment, that feels the place to be. Um, but I don't think it's reality for most universities in the UK. Right. I think that um, we've, we've got ourselves um, into a space where technology increasingly is moving at pace. So if I just think, um, you know, my analogy, having come from a health background, I guess, look at what's happening in medicine at the moment in terms of mm. the way technologies are changing what um, is required of all of the healthcare workforce, but also look at it in terms of how that's helping uh, improve quality and enhance what we can do. So I think the genie's out the bottle. Um, the, the, the pace of technology, the pace of um, expectations from students in particular who are looking for more personalized education, for more just in time education. They're looking for a different um, relationship between work, life, and, and their education. That's, that's difficult to sort of unwind um, because it's around us. All, everything that we touch and engage with in our personal lives is signaling the world's changing and changing very fast. That's one of the challenges for us is the technology curves are exponential. They are just running away. So what is it that universities in that space can hang on to? And I think um, it's difficult. Uh, the technologies can help us in terms of our efficiency and effectiveness, the administrative systems, the way in which we run the business, I guess, end of, of what we do absolutely will change and is changing. The bit that's special about universities is that place and space where we all come together, staff and students, in an environment which is, you know, very human in, in many senses, that social collision, that sharing of ideas, that um, discussion and debate that takes you to places that aren't necessarily planned. Uh, you are, you know, when you're, when you're working with really bright people um, in our institutions, it's it sometimes you might think, well, I'm gonna go from here to here, and it's a straight line. Well, when you start the conversation in an academic environment, it's very rarely a straight line. Very rarely. And I think that's the challenge for us. And that's the magic. That's the magic of what happens in a university. That relationship between academic staff, professional technical staff, students coming together. There's a bit of alchemy in there and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think where we're heading, I think where we're heading is um, trying to help ourselves to differentiate the sorts of student with the students the sorts of things that they're expecting i think there will be more digital education there will be more education designed to be digital online mm. what most of us had to do during covid was to sort of cobble together frankly most of us cobble together what we needed to do in order to get stuff shifted from our environments to online but I do think we can we learn a lot from that. And I do think we can be purposeful if we're online, design it from the outset to be online. And that supports many, many communities that wouldn't be able 
to come into a university space. And then the second bit is be purposeful, therefore, in what you do when you bring people together. So bring them into an environment which enriches that learning and doesn't do things that actually probably are more efficiently done online. So why on earth do we use the big set piece lecture mm. requiring people to travel in from all over the place to come in to sit in a 500 seater lecture and we talk at them? What is the point of that? It, it just doesn't add anything. Put them into small tutorial groups, put them into labs, put them into places where they can develop the application of that knowledge. That's absolutely worthwhile. And use broadcast, use the technology to do the broadcast bit. Now, that's a challenge for us, because if you're going to do that, you have to do it well, you, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's online. It's got to be quality. It's got to be good. Um, you can have bad lectures in any space. Um, and the magic is when you get it right. The magic is when that curiosity of something said in a lecture or something done online that then takes people to somewhere else. That's what universities do. And of course, they bring in their research and scholarship to underpin that. So you go into new areas. But we, the design of our universities has to recognize um, we have to add the value bit if we want people to come to us. I mean, just a couple of observations. It's very interesting that perhaps one of the defining lectures of all time or one of the defining series of lectures of all time was AJP Taylor's Lectures to Camera in the 1960s, which were massive events. I mean, they were massive events. And and this is online, this is online, Steve. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and and he just held, I mean, he could hold literally yeah. hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, plus a change in a sense, but I was just an observation. I was interested in your thing about technology and medicine. I was discussing it yesterday. I mean, the issue about technology and medicine and higher education is not whether the technology is coming down the line. It most certainly is. It's how you resource the implications of it, actually, particularly in medicine. Yeah. And then the last thing you would be surprised to hear was that I was in a discussion uh, with the Commonwealth Study Conferences in, in the presence of Princess Anne yesterday about farming, young, uh, how young farmers are viewing the future. And we had a farmer from Yukon, a farmer from Singapore, and a farmer from Zambia. And the one thing that they all said that COVID had done and that what the which is, is that they felt a deglobalization of food supply. And they used that word about deglobalization. And I wonder whether you saw a deglobalization of because we've gone through a period of globalization of higher education yeah. or uh, or whether we will actually globalize even more. That's a real I think we'll globalize digitally. I don't think we will necessarily globalize with the transfer of people flying in, flying out. And the reason for that is affordability one, but also people are increasingly getting concerned about climate, uh, quite rightly. So I think what happened in, and this is really interesting, what happened in COVID and, and even still happens now is that most of the big research conferences went online. Now, what that did was democratize the, the clearly that research environment, big, big conferences, but also allowed um, staff who might not normally have been able to go to those big conferences yes. to mm. access them. So it's opened up. Uh, it's made it more inclusive in many ways uh, and affordable. So I think that will continue. I think that pace of change will continue. I worry. Uh, I even worry about the UK, actually, in terms of what we see in other countries. It's ve UK is very interesting in that students go away to university. Mm. They travel now, that is less clear when you go to America and you go to um, Australia. Now, that may be geographic. It may be it's just too big. But there's something about us understanding the economics of going to university. If That's students in the UK are having to come to universities, if they're taking loans out for their uh, fees and they're, they're trying to access maintenance loans to support their living, we know that the maintenance loans are nowhere near what the real cost is of coming to a university. 
So there's a question about at what point do we get to a situation where students go to university but actually stay local yes. to the environments that they're, you know, that they've got support networks in, um, unless the university uh, locally is not able to satisfy their 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 needs either because they don't run the courses or not the right um, environment for them to thrive in so there's something about for me understanding what the model is likely to be going forward and of course we've all in our institutions spent huge sums of money on our learning teaching research environments but and in many instances accommodation Mm. Now, the business model that needs to be in play to support that at the moment, I think, is being challenged because the economy is just not helpful in supporting that that uh, investment over time. I mean, Steve, I, I spent a couple of years in Sydney a long, long time ago. You know, if you're a Sydney cider. You go to Macquarie or the University of New South Wales or the University of Sydney, or you go out to the university the West, in the Western suburbs in Parramatta. Yeah. You know, 93% of the undergraduates of Penn State University come from the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's as simple yeah. as that. And I did think that the number of students coming from within 75 miles of their university here in the UK was growing by sort of a percentage point a year. And and you're you're quite right. We will have to think a little bit more about local versus uh, bringing people. I mean, it's already happening in a sense, Steve. The University of Bristol really got very, 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 very few applications from north of Birmingham. Yeah. You know, the, the days when people came down from the northeast <laughs> to go to Bristol uh, 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 seem to be disappearing. Um and I suppose that, that, that there's going to be a tension between, you know, the, the 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 need for undergraduate and graduate education rising, and the capacity of the individual to afford that uh, education. But if they don't afford that education, how much it hamstrings them in the job market going forward? It's exactly, exactly so. And I think that that is in part why the lifelong learning piece has to be if we just think about jobs that are being created now in 20 years time there's going to be a whole raft of other stuff that's been mm. invented mm. so lifelong learning for me is now a reality you have to be you, students are going to have to reinvent themselves and keep themselves up to date as they progress beyond graduation from the from the undergraduate into the job market where they are going to have to continue to shift and change. Now, that's likely to be local. Yes. But they're unlikely to travel somewhere to do that. It's either delivered locally or it's online. Simply won't afford to do anything else. I think the other thing is that the differentiation of universities, if I, if I had one wish, I'd get rid of league tables. And that is not because, I don't, you know, league tables have a place. Of course they do. But they skew... And I think um, suppress innovation, creativity, and differentiation. We all do broadly the same stuff. That's madness. We actually need to start getting a different flavor in different places and recognize that the strengths of universities are going to be different going forward. Play sure. to the strengths. No, I, 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 absolutely. Um, what is it? It was Howard Newby. Who said that it was uh, that there were two things about the English? Uh, the first thing is that they're, they're the only people who would still have the phrase "too clever" by half, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant, <laughs> or ideas above their station. Their station. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, that we can turn diversity into a hierarchy at the drop of a hat. And that we're brilliant at doing that. We, we are world class at that. We, we are, are world brilliant. class at that. Yes. And it's that recognition of diversity. Steve, our 35 minutes is up and we could have this conversation for another hour and a half, as you know. Um, and it's been brilliant to talk to you again. And we must somehow do that halfway between South Hampshire and uh, uh, Bristol once, once you've relieved yourself of the burden of presidential office. But <laughs> thanks so much for that really insightful discussion. And uh, I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot from 
uh, and possibly will be speculating themselves as to what the uh, university sectors globally, nationally will look like. I hope they do, because that's what we need. Yeah. Okay, Steve, all the Thanks. best. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much. Visit studiosity.com slash students first for the next Students First Symposium, an open forum for faculty, staff and academics to candidly discuss and progress the issues that matter most in higher education.